everybody doing tonight? It's good to see you all. It's good to see you all. I'm Chad. Uh, I think most of you know me by now, uh, but I'm still pretty new here. I started in November, and I'm excited to get to spend some time with you tonight talking about how we share the gospel and how we have these conversations with our friends. I I, want to tell you that we're going to start with this big idea. The big idea is that God loves you so much, but you're not the whole point of his love. You know that? We can go with uh, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Have you heard that before? Yeah, I imagine you have, but you know, it's not just us that are the recipients of God's love. God wants to reach us and through us reach the people around us. And that vision is made clear in all of scripture. It's not just a New Testament thought. It's a, it's a thought that is made clear in all of scripture. So as we get started tonight, I wanna just take a few minutes and lay a foundation for why do we do all of this? If God has saved us and he's forgiven our sins, we have everything that we need, why do we care? <laughs> if God is, did all this to make it possible for us to come to him, then why doesn't he do the same thing for everyone else? Why do we have to do anything? And so that's what we're going to talk about a little bit tonight. I, I, I want to start by, by, uh, by praying, and then we'll jump into our, our studies. So um, join me real quick as we pray. Father, we ask that you would be with us, that your presence would be in this room, and that, God, we would know that no matter where you send us, if it's across the street to a neighbor, if it's down the hall to a coworker, God, if it's just down the, down the hall in our home to a, a sibling or a parent, that God, you're with us. And God, your mission has not changed. Your mission to bring people from every tribe, tongue, and language on the planet to a a salvation that glorifies you. We pray, God, that you would use us for your kingdom and for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. I wanna start by, by turning in your Bibles to Psalm 67. It's a wonderful psalm. I hope that you have it underlined. If you don't, you should underline it. Um, it's classically known as the missionary psalm, if you haven't heard it. Um, what we're going to start with, though, is a verse that you've definitely heard if you've been in church for very long. And it starts like this, Psalm 67 in verse 1. You guys have heard it. It says, may God be gracious to us and bless us and make his face shine on us. Have you guys heard that before? How many times have you heard it? Think about it. A time or two, maybe, maybe many. In fact, it's a normal part of a doxology. Sometimes it's something that you'll say at the end of a service. Many services will end with these words because it's such a beautiful thing. But I want you to look at the first two words of the next verse. And I bet you this might be surprising to you. What are those first two words? Anybody see it? So that. These are two incredibly crucial words. Think about the whole, the, whole, the whole verse. May God be gracious to us and bless us and make his face shine upon us. We love that part, right? But why should he do all of those things for us? So that your ways may be known in all the earth and your salvation among all nations. This is one of those places where we love the first verse and oftentimes we don't read the second one. But the second one is what qualifies the why for the first one. And so I want you to know as we, as we start this whole thing, I think many people in the Western church, when I think about Europe and America, many of us have, have taken the gospel as if it's just for us and we forget the so that. Because God's vision goes beyond us, and it goes beyond us to the people in our lives, and we're going to talk a lot about that tonight. How does God plan to use you to reach those people that he's put around you? I use the term, how, how do you reach the people who are close to you but far from God? Because that's your first mission field. It's the single mission field that all of us have, no matter who we are, where we are, what station we are in life, whether we're young or whether we're old, whether we're retired or whether we're at work, we all have that. We have an oikos, it's a, it's a, it's a relational network that surrounds us and it's our first mission field. And so today we're gonna walk through a number of verses that just try to tie together uh, a, a, a panorama, a, a vision of all these verses in scripture that talk about how important this is for God. And then we're gonna spend some time talking about some very practical tools that you can use as you seek to build opportunities with the people in your life. And so we're gonna read through the rest of this real quick. We're just gonna do it fast. 
highlight Psalm 67. The whole chapter is just this amazing um, moment where, where David is talking about how God deserves praise from all the nations. So look at verse three. It says, may the peoples praise you, O God. May all the peoples praise you. May the nations be glad and sing for joy for you rule the peoples with equity and guide the nations of the earth. May the peoples praise you, God. May all the peoples praise you. The land yields its harvest. God, our God, blesses us. May God bless us still, and there we go again, so that all the ends of the earth will fear him. Amen. What's the purpose? What's the purpose? The purpose is that God would call to himself a people that glorifies him from every people, place, and nation on the planet. Can you imagine what that would look like? Do you know how many people live in the world today? We have crossed the 8 billion mark. If you didn't know that, it was just happened this last, this last fall. 8 billion people live on the planet. 8 billion people that God wants to, 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 to be real with. He created them with dignity and, and life and, and hope. And they're created with a purpose to return and reflect his glory to him. And so we have a responsibility as followers of God to make it possible for those in our lives to know him. Tonight, we're going to talk about same culture relationships. We're going to talk about people who are close to us. We're going to talk about people that you see, that look like you, act like you, talk like you, like the things you like, probably live and act a lot like the things you like to do. But there's a whole nother topic, if we want to take this another time, we'll go down this whole idea of how you go cross-cultural, and that's a whole different conversation. Today, we're going to talk about a word that we find in Acts chapter 10. It's called oikos. Oikos is the Greek word for household. We just this last weekend had a sermon on, on Cornelius, and Cornelius gathered his entire oikos. It was his whole household, and the household for, for that first century leader, Cornelius, was his family. It was probably the people that worked underneath him. It was probably people that reported to him in some way, and so he gathered his whole relational network into his home, and when he invited Peter to come and talk to him, guess what? Everyone that was with him heard what Peter had to say, and the whole group came to faith together. What a crazy thing. Could you imagine? We don't hear another word about Cornelius moving forward in the scriptures, but what happened in his home? Do you think that there was a place there that gathered? Do you think all those Roman centurions and soldiers. I think they gathered with, with Cornelius to learn more about God and, and read letters from these guys or talk to the apostles when they're available. How do you think that went forward from there? It's very likely that there was a church that met in Cornelius' home after that. Wouldn't that be incredible? Okay, so here we go. We're going to jump in. I'm, I'm like all over the place already. Psalm 67. So we're going to jump all the way back to the beginning. Go with me to, to Genesis chapter 1, verse 28. You guys have heard this verse as well. It says, God blessed them and said to them, he just created man and woman. He says, be fruitful and increase in number. Listen to the next line. Fill the earth and subdue it. Some of your translations might say uh, to have dominion over it. Um, most biblical theologians will talk about this idea of steward, what God's, been given, what God's given us. And it's this idea, think about it again. This is before sin has entered the world. This picture paints a, a picture of, of the world completely filled with people that do what? That love God. We have this vision from the very first chapter of Scripture of a world full of people that are not distracted or divided by sickness or sin or war or death. And the picture is that the God-fearing, the God-loving uh, couple that he's speaking to will fill the earth with God-fearers, people that love him and reflect his glory. Now, we know that that didn't last very long, right? But if you jump forward just a few chapters to Genesis chapter 12, we see the beginning. Most, most again, theologians will talk about this is, the primary, this is the beginning of the primary story of Scripture. The first 11 chapters of Scripture might be thought of like the preamble. This is, the, this is important but ancient. But starting in chapter 12, we get the story of a man named Abram. And Abram is a really important figure in Scripture. He becomes Abraham, and, and his sons uh, become the, 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 the fathers of Jacob, and Jacob becomes the father of the 12 sons who become the father of the Israelites. So Abraham begins this primary story, the big story of Scripture, is God's movement through Abraham's descendants that culminate in the person of Jesus Christ. 
But look with me at Genesis chapter 12, starting in verse, uh, verse 1. Look at the command that God gives to Abraham. The Lord said to Abraham, go from your country, your people, your father's household to the land that I will show you. I will make you into a great nation and I will bless you. I will make your name great and you will be a blessing. These, are, these sound really nice, right? This is a good part. And then he says, I will bless those who bless you and whoever curses you, I will curse. And look at this last line. And all the peoples of the earth will be blessed through you. Again, all the way back here in Genesis, we're not talking about Matthew, folks. This is all the way back to the very beginning. God shows his purpose with Abraham is not just to bless Abraham and his descendants, but it's to bless who? All the peoples of the earth. The word there that's translated families, the word that some places translate as nations, it's the same word that we find in the New Testament, which is Matthew 28. We're going to read it in just a minute. And it means ethne. It means every people group on the planet. It's, it's people who are divided by language, culture, and customs. And so I want you to get this perspective that God wants to see people from every language, culture, and custom. Tribe, tongue, and nation is another way we might say it. He wants to see people from all those places reflecting his glory. And so from the beginning, please hear me, the purpose of God has not been to reach one person or one nation. The purpose of God is to reach all people in all nations and to reflect himself in their lives. And by doing so, it makes their lives better. It makes our lives better. It makes their lives fully formed for the purpose that they were created for. And it also gives us this, this incredible moment to be in relationship with the guy that created us, with the God that made us. And so I want you to see just how big a picture this is. There's other verses. Habakkuk 2.14 says, Let your glory fill the earth as the waters cover the sea. We could go, uh, again, Matthew 28, 18 through 20. At the end of Jesus' life, he gives his disciples the Great Commission. You've all heard it before. He says to them, um, um, All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all Nations, again, do you see the word? Baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey all that I've commanded you, for I am with you always to the very end of the age. Have you guys heard that before? Again, notice the command to the disciples was not to go and witness to their children. It was to go make disciples of who? All of the nations. From the beginning, the heart of God was to use his people to reach all peoples. It was to call to himself a people that would result in the peoples of the world hearing about this great God. And so Jesus didn't just affirm this at the end of his life, he lived it out throughout his life as well. Do you realize his ministry um, centered in the northern part of Israel where the, the Gentiles lived? He worked in Galilee among the 10 cities. You guys have heard about the Decapolis. It's where he sends the, the demoniac to, the, to go and share. Over and over again, Jesus presents and, and shows his miracles into places that the Jews would not have been to begin with. There's amazing breakthroughs in different cultures that would be incredible. The, probably the most meaningful is with the Samaritan woman at the well. Right? They shouldn't have even been there. But they go there, and the disciples go to find Jesus some food. And this lady comes out to get some water. And Jesus asks her for some water, and she's surprised that he would even talk to her. And what happens? She has this interaction with Jesus, and it's so powerful that she goes back into town. And the disciples come back with the food. And Jesus said, I don't need food. I've already eaten. They're frustrated. Why do we go get food? Why did you, who brought you food, Jesus? He says, I've had food that will feed me for eternity. And they're like, what is he talking about? And this woman comes out, and who comes with her? The whole town comes with her. And as that whole town comes out, they get to meet the same person that she met. That's what we're asking you to be. The person that finds Jesus and is willing to go back and tell everyone you know about what he's done for you. All right, so... A couple more verses and then we'll, we'll finish. You probably, you've all heard Acts 1.8, that you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, and to the very ends of the earth. We've been walking through the book of Acts. We've seen that happen in multiple places. Um, you've read the verse in Revelation chapter 7, verse 9, where before the throne of God is people from every what? Tribe, tongue, and nation. Jason just read this a minute ago. And they're glorifying him. They're saying salvation belongs to the Lamb. 
and, and to, the, to the one who sits on the throne. And you've got this beautiful picture where we're gonna see one day in heaven, the ultimate culmination of the promise of Abraham, that all peoples will be gathered in front of the throne of God, worshiping him and those peoples, the ethne will be represented there. So why is this important? Why is this important? The, the, the first thing I want to tell you, the why is such a big deal. Why should you be concerned with the lost? Because God is. If it wasn't his concern for the lost, who of us would be here? Who of us was born in the church? And if you happen to be born into a Christian home, that's wonderful, but how far back do you have to go before somebody made a major change and it impacted their eternity? God cares. And the simple why is that he's always cared. We could also add that Jesus commands us to go. That's a kind of important thing to go make disciples is a rather important command when we talk about it, isn't it? So here's the thing, every disciple, every follower of Jesus, everyone that calls Jesus their Lord has a responsibility to share their faith with those around them. And that makes everyone nervous, right? Let me tell you, I've been a missions pastor now for 20 years, 23 years. And every time I have an opportunity to share my faith, guess what happens? I have about a hundred reasons why it's not a good idea right that minute. You would think after 20 something years of doing this that it would be really easy, right? But you have to realize there's an enemy at work and that enemy's job is to distract you, to discourage you, and to tell you that this isn't gonna matter. They're probably gonna get angry when you bring it up. Have you ever had that thought before? But that's just not the truth. In all of my experiences, 25 years of gospel sharing, I've only had one person, one person, tell me that they weren't interested and they'd rather not talk about it again, and that was my brother, who used to be a believer. This this is incredible to me because almost every time I start a conversation like I'm going to teach you how to do tonight, people are generally very, very kind about it. There might be people who say, oh, no, thank you, I'm not interested, but they're not angry or violent or virulent, they're not yelling at me or screaming at me, they're very, very kind, and most of them, probably 80 to 90%, give me some positive reaction. If I ask someone, how can I pray for you? They almost always say, ugh, man, it's a hard question, because, and they start listing out things that are going on in their life. Even atheists don't mind if you pray for them, I mean, what's it gonna hurt? And so there's a lot of things we're going to talk about. So so first off is I want you to answer really clearly, why? Why do we want you to share the gospel? Is it so that we can get more people crammed into the church? No. I mean, it'd be great if God chooses to grow our church. That's something we would love. But that's not why we share the gospel. We share the gospel because Jesus loves them and he made them. The very simple why is he commands us to and it's been his heart from the beginning of time. So the next question I want to answer is who? Who? Who do we share the gospel with? I've already kind of answered it. I've given you some, some cheats. It's, it's the people that God has put around us. Now, you may be one of the very few people that don't know any non-believers. This is Bernie. You know what? <laughs> Just the other day, I found out this. Listen to this. This is crazy. They, somebody was trying to figure out how many believers were at Easter service last year in 2022, and they counted how many were at Curry Creek, and how many were 1910, and how many were at the bridge, and how many were here. They said there were 7,000 people in attendance on Easter Sunday in, 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 in Bernie. That doesn't count Mission City, which I bet had a couple thousand as well, maybe more than that. And there's probably some other churches. There's a Lutheran church and a Presbyterian church. So just think about that. What does that mean? <laughs> Bernie has roughly 19 to 21,000 people live here, right? Half of Bernie went to church last Easter. If we could just get a few of them to talk to their friends, we could saturate Bernie with the gospel like this. If every one of the 10,000 roughly that were at church last Easter would share the faith with one other person, we might be able to saturate Bernie in a day. We're probably not gonna get 100% adoption, but what if just 1,000 people would share their faith with their non-believing friends? A couple times a year, we could saturate Bernie in a few weeks. Listen, it is, It is important enough 
for us to do the work to find out what's it going to take to see the kingdom of God advanced in this place? It's a great question. It's a big question. If you're one of those people that don't know any non-believers, then I want to encourage you, go to HEB. <laughs> Start making new friends. Look for those people that Daniel was talking about last week with tattoos on their arms and just say, hey, how are you? How can I pray for you? People are going to be nice and welcome to that, especially here. Especially here. We're like, this is like probably the most conservative city and one of the most conservative counties and the most conservative state and the most conservative country in the world. Like, come on. You're not going to get any more Christian than this. You're not going to find any more safe environment for you to practice sharing your faith. And if God would challenge us and move in us, who knows what might end? I've been talking about these ideas of what's it going to take to saturate Bernie, but there's 47,000 people in Kendall County. How are we going to ensure that everyone in Kendall County hears the gospel every year or so? What if we were to go on further west? There's a whole bunch of counties out there with a few people, 10,000 people in a whole county when you start getting out there a little further. But you know, on the other direction, if we go Bear County, we've got millions of people. I kind of want to ignore that because it's so big. But there's whole people groups. There's Afghan refugees there. They're from unreached places of the world that you and I can't fly to and go meet them there. But some of them moved 20 minutes away from us. There are homeless people downtown. Kenny back there goes every week. People from our church to serve them and care for them and reach out to them. There are people right here in our own neighborhoods. There are times people in our own parking lots who are sleeping in their cars there are people here if you look for them. Ken Stevens has told me that there's, there's places in Bernie where we can find whole communities that don't even speak English. Do you know that those places exist in this city? Well, listen, here's the good news. I'm not asking you to go to those places yet. <laughs> I'm talking about how do you invite people who are like you, same culture. So who are they? Who are they? Who are the people in your life like the people that Cornelius invited into his home? Who are the people that you see day in and day out? They're close to you, but far from God. If you opened up uh, your, your booklet, some of you already got a prayer guide a few weeks ago. Uh, the second page of that prayer guide had this little list. We call it a lost saved list. You guys remember seeing this in there? It's this little box. And I gave you these two lists because I want you to start thinking through who are the people that are natural in your life that you have access to that need Jesus. And you put them in that lost list. Don't show them the list, by the way. And then I also gave you a saved list because I think probably a lot of us know people who are believers that aren't living like it. And it's okay to start praying for them as well. Because I'm going to tell you, uh, one of my friends, a trainer, his name was Ying Kai. Ying Kai started a movement in China. And listen to this. In China, he was sent to a state that had no known believers and 26 million people there. He prayed and said, God, I don't even know. If I planted a church every year for the rest of my life, there would only be like 15 churches or 25 churches out of 26 million people. How in the world is that enough? He said, teach me how to start something that can result in more people. You know what happened? God started moving in his heart. He started learning how to train people to share their faith with others. And they saw 200,000 house churches planted and three and a half million new believers in about eight years. Can you imagine? Can you imagine? I'm asking you to start looking. Who are the people in your life that you're praying for? This list is for you to pray for them, okay? So list, I put 10 on each of these. Pray for your lost friends, people that you don't think are believers. Pray for them. And secondly, on the safe side, pray for people that you think are believers but maybe need to be discipled. Ying Kai would tell me every time I saw him, don't pick anyone. He'd say, train everyone. And if they're already believers, that's great. Start discipling them to join your team. <laughs> Like there was no middle ground. There was nobody that could just scoot along because you're believers. Good, you're safe, cool, I'll leave you alone. No, it was like, next is how are we gonna move forward with the persons that God has put in your life? How can I coach you and care for you and shape you and equip you to do what God has called you to do? And every single one of us has a responsibility to move forward with it. That's what we as a church are. We're supposed to equip you to do the work that God has called you to do. We're not supposed to do the work for you. That's a tough thing to say in an American church. But it's something that we all need to hear and think about. So 
If you haven't filled this out, if you don't know who your lost friends are, your friends that need to grow in their faith, man, take some time. That is your homework tonight, is to think through who are the people that you can be praying for that are lost and people that need to grow in their faith. And then start thinking through what steps you need to take to share your faith with the lost ones and encourage the saved ones to get in the game, <laughs> to get busy acting like believers. How do you do that? Well, you could do just what I did. I can give you a list of scriptures. You could say, this is an important thing that God cares about. So will you partner with me? Let's go meet some people and talk about Jesus with them. Anyway, I'll stop there. Lost, save list. This is oikos. These are people who you know. I'm not talking about going out and meeting strangers at this point. Just so we're clear, in the last probably 30 years, there has been huge evangelism trainings all across the country. You've probably been a part of some. EE, -E, and you guys heard EE, -E, Evangelism Explosion. Uh, there's been so many different movements. That there, uh, you know, if we go back 50 years, there's been huge revivals that have swept. There's been Billy Graham Crusades and Luis Palau Crusades. And they give this strong, powerful presentation of the gospel, and sometimes thousands of people respond. Have you guys seen these things you know what I'm talking about? It, it, it sometimes is amazing, and, and the fruit of those things kind of go a long way. As we could talk about guys like Bill Bright, a guy that started Campus Crusade for Christ, and he was saved at a Billy Graham crusade. You know, how could you imagine that God would do such a great work uh, out of somebody that came to faith in a big crowd like that? But those crusades have had less and less impact over the last 20 years. They're getting smaller and smaller, and even though they can get a huge crowd, the churches that put them on very, very rarely see any bump in attendance after the crusade. I was a part of one in Seattle. We worked for two years with the Luis Palau team to do a city serve event. We had about 100 churches and we had about 10,000 people show up to the event at Mary Moore Park uh, that day in Issaquah. And, uh, and it, was, it was in Redmond, sorry. And it was, it was an amazing day and everyone was so excited. And you know, we were so disappointed because the thousands of people that responded to the altar didn't go to any of the churches. We asked afterwards, hey, who's been seeing? What happened to the 2,000 people that responded that day at the altar when Louise preached? We couldn't find any of them. We were so frustrated and so sad. The amount of work that would, my point isn't that we shouldn't do crusades. My point is that God moves closest through people, through relationships. Luis Palau cannot jump into your connections and love them the way that you can, just like I can't. If you said, Chad, if you would just come to my home and preach the gospel to my family, it would be great. Well, I might come in and give a really powerful presentation of the gospel. They might say, this is awesome. But then guess what? They don't know me. I don't know them. And what's the likelihood that I'm going to have to spend time with them every week for the next 15 weeks to help them grow in Christ? No. And the same thing happens. Now, guys, I don't want to put, I want to step on anyone's toes right now. The same thing happens when you try to export Christianity for your friends to your church. When you say, listen, I don't really know how to share the gospel, but I'm going to invite them to church. And then Pastor Jason can take care of the rest. Somebody still has to love them and care for them and hold their hand and walk them through what's going to happen next. We can't do this without you. And so my goal is to give you every tool to be fully formed so that you can lead your friends to Christ and do exactly what the Great Commission says, teach them how to follow all that he has commanded them to obey. Teach them to obey all that he has commanded them. That's our task. The church is here to support and equip and strengthen you and give you every tool you need. And if you want, we would love for you to come worship. We would love for them to come worship with us. We can celebrate all that God's doing together. But don't, what's the word? Outsource. Don't outsource your responsibility to a church because we have really good people here. It's our responsibility. It's my responsibility. My mom is not a believer. My mom is not your responsibility, right? I love her and she knows that. And I've shared the gospel with her 40 or 50 times over my, my faith. And, and, and I love her and she knows that. But there's no way Jason could take that from me. Now, Jason might be able to give a really powerful presence of the gospel and maybe she'll be excited about that. But she's going to call me next and say, hey, what about this? What about this? What about this? So be ready. Be ready. I'm looking at you guys. And so many of you, I know you've been in the church for a while. You know what I'm talking about here. This isn't brand new. So we talk about why do we do this? Why do we share our faith? 
It's because it's what God wants us to do. It's what he's been doing since the beginning of time. Who are we going to share it with? I'm going to tell one more story. If you go to Mark chapter 1, this is a beautiful picture. Um, Mark chapter 1. I talk fast sometimes, so thank you for saying that. I can slow down a little bit. Mark chapter 1, Jesus calls his first four disciples. You've probably seen it. He's walking along the Sea of Galilee, and he says to a guy named Andrew and his brother Simon, come follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. Have you guys heard this story before? Okay. If you go down just a few verses, he calls the other two, James and John, the sons of thunder, and they also do the same thing. They immediately drop their nets and follow Jesus. If you go down a few more verses, they go into Capernaum. And in Capernaum, they go to a synagogue. Capernaum is really important, by the way. And some things happen in the synagogue, and things get kind of crazy. But after they leave the synagogue, this is the same day. So Jesus calls these disciples, come follow me, I'll make you fishers of men. Immediately go to the synagogue, and immediately afterwards, they go to Simon's house. Do you guys know what Simon's other name is? Say it out loud. Peter! Peter! Have you guys heard anything about this guy, Peter? It's kind of a big deal in Acts, right? It's kind of a big deal in church history. So they go to Peter's house. Do you guys know what happens when they get to Peter's house? His mom is sick. His mother-in-law is sick. By the way, Peter was married. If you didn't know that, the first pope was married. Anyway, we'll leave that for another time. So Peter's mother-in-law was sick, and she's so sick that she can't get out of bed. So what does Peter do? He asked Jesus, hey, guess what, mom? I got Jesus with me. So he introduces her to Jesus, and what does Jesus do? He heals the mother-in-law. And that's where the story ends, right? No. Listen, word gets out that Jesus is at Peter's house, and it says that at the door, this is at Peter's house, all of Capernaum brings out their sick and demon-possessed, and Jesus heals them all. Now, why is this such a big deal? I told you about Cornelius. He, he invited Peter to his home, and Peter shares the gospel with all of his family and friends and network. This is Peter doing the exact same thing. He meets Jesus by the side of the sea and says, Peter, come, or Jesus, come with me. I want you to come to my house. He gets to his house and immediately introduces his mom, his mother-in-law to Jesus. And then the word gets out, and all of Peter's community comes to Peter's doorstep, and Jesus meets all of them. Think about that. This is day one. Peter became an ambassador of Christ the day he met him. We call that person a person of peace. If you've never heard that term, you should write it down. It's a primary strategy in world missions today. It's when you go into a community and you try to find one person that welcomes you. And that person makes their whole community available because they love you. There's three qualities of a person of peace, and I want you to write these down. I don't have it in any notes. The first thing is that the person of peace, they welcome the messenger. Peter welcomed Jesus' words in his life. He welcomed the messenger. The second thing is he welcomes the message. A person of peace welcomes the messenger, and they welcome the message, but it doesn't stop there. The last thing, the person of peace welcomes the mission. Listen, Peter didn't just hear Jesus and like him. He didn't just enjoy his company and say, let's go have dinner. He took Jesus and introduced him to everyone he knew. Jesus' mission immediately became Peter's mission. And the question I have is not whether you can find a person of peace. It's are you a person of peace? So many believers I know welcome the message and they welcome the, the, the messenger, but they don't care about the mission. If they do, they think they can outsource it. (laughs) And that's a big deal. So are you a person of peace? Well, this Easter, we're challenging you in some way kind of to prove it. We're saying, what? Pray for three lost people, share your faith with two, and invite someone into your home. we, We put these boxes together. I'm gonna get to the box. I don't wanna, I'm sorry. We have a little while left. And so we've talked about why do we share the gospel? Because it's God's mission on the planet. Who do we share it with? The people that he's put around us in our lives. So now I want to take a few minutes and talk about what do we say? How do we share the gospel? When I talk to most believers, that's where things come to a screeching halt. 
They're like, we just don't know what to say. Have you ever had that issue? Good. Good, that's perfect, because I'm going to tell you, it's not that hard. And here's the first thing you need to know. You don't save them. Do you know that? There's no magic words that will make your non-believing friend say these magic words and you're now a Christian. That doesn't happen. What happens is this. God opens their hearts to respond to the gospel. And then you say to them something silly like, would you like to know Jesus? And they say, I've been waiting for someone to ask me that. Now, how easy would it be to share the gospel with somebody that says, I've been waiting to hear this? So it it might be a little more tricky than that, but not much. But what I want you to say is, I want you to say something simple. These are people who know you. We're talking about your oikos. We're talking about your household, your family, your friends, your network. Ask them how you can pray for them. Very simple. It's It's a tool I want you to know. It's called prayer, care, share. Prayer, care, share. The first step is, how can I pray for you? If it's a complete stranger that I don't know, I I, I preface it like I'm a believer and I try to ask people I'm getting to know how I can pray for them. How can I pray for you? And that little tiny introduction is almost always enough. I've done this multiple times at Black Rifle Coffee. I've prayed for a couple guys behind the counter. I've prayed for a couple guys in line. There was a Mercedes dealer manager in line. I'll talk to him for a little bit and say, hey, I like to pray for people. How can I pray for you? He said, oh, you know, my family's going through some stuff right now. So how can I so we pray right there in the line at Black Rifle Coffee? Like you can have those conversations and they're not threatening. And if they say, well, not really, what have you lost? You've at least said it's important. So here's the first thing is offer to pray for them. If they're your family, every time you talk to them, hey, I know you don't even agree with me. You know I go to church, but I always want to ask, how can I pray for you? They'll say, oh, grandma, I'm so tired of you asking me how you can pray for me. But I have a math test on Friday, so pray that it goes well. (laughs) Always ask, how can I pray for you? Because the moment that they say, I really need something, it gives you an opportunity to care in a very meaningful way. So the first thing, ask them how to pray. When they ask you to pray for them, pray for them right then and there. That's how you care. Prayer, care, share. Care is is praying for them right there in that moment. And if you know that there's another way that you can serve them, if someone, if you know someone in your family that's struggling financially and they don't have money for food, hey, can I bring you a meal? It's another very caring thing that you can do for someone in your your community. There's uh, there's so many little ways that that you can care for someone around you. Uh, One of our neighbors found out they were pregnant, so I was just talking to them and seeing if there's any way that I can serve them. And, uh, and, they said no, but I, kept, I keep asking. I keep asking, how can I help you? How can we pray for, it's, it's crazy. Patrick told me to back off because it's, it's the guy he's praying for. Patrick left, didn't he? Patrick said, that's my lost person. Leave him alone. <laughs> so pray for them. Offer to pray. Care for them. Pray for them. You know that there's a statistic that says most people have never heard their name in a prayer. So if you pray for them, pray for them by name. If it's someone that you don't know, like I just mentioned, somebody in line at Black Rifle Coffee, I ask him, and he tells me that his family's having a hard time. I ask him, well, what's your name? What's going on? Can I get any more details? And then I say, do you mind if I pray for you right now? So I pray with their name and those details in a prayer, and you look up and the guy's teared up because people aren't used to that. That doesn't happen. And it's okay, guys. It's okay. We're talking about people who know you. They probably already know you're a believer if you're in their life. And the last thing is share. So think about this. If you offer to pray for somebody and they say, sure, pray for my mom. She's sick. And you say, what's her name? Well, her name is Samantha. Okay, let me pray for Samantha. And you pray for her right then and there. Then you can follow up that and say, have you, I'm so thankful that you give me an opportunity to pray for you. Have you ever had a relationship with Jesus? And right then and there, you've drawn a line in the sand. And most people right then might say, I really don't have time for that. But some people are saying, you know, I really need something in my life. And you know that God's already working in their heart. Guys, this is the whole thing. All that we're teaching right now, all of our gospel conversation training today, is to give you the tools to start a conversation that will lead you to an opportunity to give someone the hope of the gospel. That's all we're doing. This is, this, is, this is the crawl step. We're not at walk and run and sprint. We're just trying to get you to crawl. Just start the conversations with people. Ask them how you can pray and see what God will do. 
Prayer, care, share. So if you get to a share moment, what do you say? I'll tell you, I don't want to get, I don't want to say it too strong, but what you say is important there, but it's not magic, right? Somebody might say, oh, I can't remember the five verses in the Roman road. What am I going to do? Right? Oh, they drew this diagram at church and it was the bridge diagram and I'm not sure how to do that exactly. Listen, it's a very simple thing to give somebody the hope of the gospel. It's to say, Jesus loves you. He died on the cross for your sins. And he wants you to know him. Are you interested in knowing him? If they say yes to that, you got a great start. <laughs> Follow up, talk to them, ask them if you can meet later and go home and watch the bridge a hundred times so you can do it right when you see them. All those things are possible. So ask those questions. So here's what I want to do. I want to give you a couple of conversations. So we have prayer, care, share, pray, ask them to pray, care for them by praying, and then share some little way for them to know that Jesus cares about them. I want to tell you, uh, I want to give you a tool. It's called the 15 second testimony. All right. You guys have something to write with. I'm going to put some things on the board real quick. The 15-second testimony. Now, how, have you, how many of you have written your testimony out before? All right. We got like some superstars. That's great. Um, how many of you have done it in 15 seconds or less? <laughs> well, here's the reason. We used to do this and tell everyone like three minutes or less, three-minute testimonies. And then we went down to one-minute testimony. And then the last time I was talking to our friends who've been doing this all over the world, they're like, no, people don't want to listen even for a minute. So we're going to do a 15-second testimony. And here's why. The 15-second testimony is just enough to say that Jesus changed my life. Have you ever met him before? And that's enough for them to tell you whether they're interested, whether they're not interested at all, or whether they're just not, whether they're too busy to take the time. And that's what we're looking for, right? We're trying to measure whether God is drawing them to him. So here's, here's how you do the 15 second testimony. On your piece of paper, if you have it, draw two lines and on these lines, put two words that describe your life before you met Jesus. When I do this, I put the words poor and broken. Okay, and on this side, you'll leave a gap in the middle, put two words that describe your life since you've met Jesus. They're probably going to be kind of like the opposite of these words. So for me, I always use the words hope and a future. Hope and a future. And so then in the middle, we're going to just put this box here where you have a really, really concise, simple gospel presentation. And it says this. It says, Jesus came down from heaven. We draw an arrow down. He died on the cross. For all sin, we have a cross. And then God raised him from the dead. And he's the king of all things. And if you're a good artist, you can draw a crown. Something like that. It's like a terrible crown. Okay, so here we have it. My two words before I met Jesus. My simple Jesus story. He came down from heaven lived a perfect life. He died on the cross for all sin. God raised him from the dead and is the king of all things. Okay, so my 15 second testimony, if you were to take out a timer right now, it goes very simple. When I was young, my family was poor and broken. But then I heard about Jesus. I found out that he came down from heaven and lived his perfect life. He died on the cross for all sin and God raised him to new life and now he's the king of all things. And because I met him now, I know I have a hope and a future. And then the last thing is a question mark. You ask the question, have you ever known Jesus or met Jesus? So my 15 second testimony is super fast, but the goal is to ask this question, have you ever met Jesus? And that question gives you an indicator of what's happening next. So, I'm going to give you a few minutes to prepare your 15-second testimony. You're like, wait a second. Oh, yeah, you're going to be quizzed. The person next to you is going to listen to it in just a few minutes. So, take a few minutes. Write down two words that describe your life before you met Jesus. 
Practice how you're going to say he came down from heaven and lived a perfect life. He died on the cross for all sin. He was raised to new life, and he's the king of all things. And then what are your two words afterwards? And then I'm going to ask the person that listens to you if you ask the question. If you don't ask the question, we've got to start all over. All right? So take a few minutes, prepare your 15-second testimony, and then we're going to practice this with each other. And if we get really excited, we might even get up and move around and tell a few people about it. All right? Do we have any questions before we take a little bit of a break here? I say a little bit, like we're going to give you like three or four minutes. What were the three statements? Three statements. Jesus came down from heaven and lived a perfect life. He died on the cross for all sin. God raised him from the dead, and he's the king of all things. This is something that should roll off of our tongue all the time. And honestly, if you skip the Jesus part and you just go to the question, it probably is going to be close enough. You want to find out if people are searching for God and if God is calling them. God does the saving, not us. Now, some of you might think this is kind of a weak gospel presentation. And I think in 15 seconds, it kind of has to be. Right? This isn't the full, whole thing. We haven't talked about how God has to save us from our sin. There's a lot of other pieces to it. But this is a start. It's getting the conversation started. It's getting getting you comfortable with sharing something like this and them giving you an opportunity to know where their heart is. I hope that this is liberating to you because I'm not asking you to, to, to share the whole thing that the track says. I'm just asking you to, to share your heart with them in a simple way. Here in a minute, I'm going to demonstrate a larger gospel presentation tool. It's called the Three Circles. And it's, it's substantially more. It takes three to five minutes it's a, it's a whole uh, paper of, of how to do this. And we're going to give you inside the kit that, that you guys are going to get tonight. Inside the kit is a, a QR code to go and watch a video where you can see it modeled. If you need to watch it a time or two and practice it yourself, you can. I'm going to model it for you, but I'm not going to ask you to, to master it tonight. I would love for you to master this tonight. I would love for you to practice this a couple of times and, and get used to it so that you can can learn and practice it more and more and have it as, a, as part of your toolbox, so to speak, that when you need it, you have it. The prayer, care, share tool, how can I pray for you? Pray for someone on the spot. You can master that right here, right now, and know exactly what to do when you talk to your friend tomorrow. Can I pray for you? That can, that's easy, right? You can do that. If you're so bold as to do what we ask you to do and you invite someone into your home, And you ask them before you eat your barbecue meal and before your your hamburgers, hey, we're going to pray for our meal. How can we pray for your family? (laughs) They're going to give you a response right then and there. You've got them in your home for a meal. They're going to be super happy about that. You're going to pray. That's a normal part. They're in your home. It's going to be a wide open opportunity for you to pray for them. So ask them, what's going on in your life? How can we pray for you? Can I pray for you by name? Do all of that right there. And if they're interested, if they're excited about it, Share your 15-second testimony and ask them if they've ever met Jesus before. It'll make for a great conversation one way or another. And they'll know this. When they leave your home, that if they ever need to find Jesus, they know right where to go. I'm going to model it for you one more time. Okay? When I was young, my family was poor and broken. But then I learned about Jesus. I found out that he came down from heaven and lived a perfect life. He died on the cross for all sin. And then God raised him from the dead and he's the king of all things. What I found out about that, it changed me. And now I have a hope and a future. Have you ever met Jesus? Please practice this. Let this become something you're so familiar with that it's something that flies off your tongue very easily. And then the only thing you have to do is overcome your nerves and speak it when you have it ready. If you're like, oh, I don't remember what I'm supposed to say, then ask them how you can pray for them. Oh, 
there's so much, so much more I, I want to give you. We've got a few more minutes, but let me, let me model for you the three circles gospel presentation. This, this, this tool, the three circles, may be the most well-researched gospel presentation tool in history. It's being used by almost every major missions organization on the planet. M- millions of people have come to faith through this tool. And, uh, and so it's, again, there's no magic words. The Roman road was wonderful. The bridge illustration that you might have used is wonderful. Some of you might have seen some really cool contraptions like the Evangel cube that vault folds into different places and see the gospel. There are lots of different tools, and I would tell you, the best thing is a, a, cool, a tool that you're comfortable with, a tool that you know well. But if you don't know one, this one is a really good one. And it starts by drawing a circle, and you say, the world is broken, and you draw a mark on it. The world is broken. And you can see the effects of the brokenness everywhere. You see it with the war and tragedy and sickness and the problems that you see. Do you guys know that? You ask the person, do you know that the world is broken? And people are almost like, yes, we know. And you say, but it hasn't always been that way. God created the world and everything was good. In fact, it was God's perfect world. It was beautiful and there was no sickness and no fighting and no sin. There was nothing that divided us from each other or divided us from God. What do you think it would be like to live in a world like that? But listen, mankind, we decided to do what we wanted instead of what God wanted and that is called sin. God said if we would do what he wanted, we could stay here, but instead we did what we wanted and, and we chose to do our own thing and so we, 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 we live in this broken place and this brokenness and people try to get out of brokenness. No one likes it. No one likes it. So some people think if they can win enough, if they can be powerful or successful, successful enough, they can get out of brokenness. Some people think if they can make enough money, they can get out of brokenness. Some people think if they can be good enough, they can earn God's favor. And they can escape brokenness that way. Some people just decide they can't do it at all and they try to hide their brokenness with any kind of addiction that will just take away the pain. Drugs, alcohol, whatever. But all of these things are empty pursuits and they take you right back, sometimes in worse condition than where you started. You might ask them, do you know that this is true? What do you think people would say? Yeah. You see the effects of it. You see it everywhere. You've seen divorce in your lives and your families. You've seen brokenness all around you. People know it. But here's the beautiful thing is God saw our brokenness and he did not want us to stay there. He provided a door out. He says that if we will turn from our brokenness and repent of our sin, that we can find Jesus. The third circle is his answer. Jesus, he came down from heaven. This is going to be familiar to you. He died on the cross from all sin. He came down from heaven and lived a perfect life. He died on the cross for all sin. And God raised him to new life, and he's the king of all things. And so God says, if you turn from your sin and repent, then he will restore your relationship and redeem us. I'm spelling redeem wrong. He'll restore his perfect plan in our lives. This is the beautiful thing about this. I draw a line right here, and I ask the person, I hand them the pen, I said, would you think that you're closer to God's perfect plan or closer to brokenness in your life? And I tell them, tell me where it would go. Every time I've done this, if they weren't a believer, they put a mark somewhere over here close to brokenness. And then the question, do you want to stay there? Because today you can turn from your sin and repent and follow Jesus, make him your king and God will restore your relationship and you can be in perfect relationship with the God that made you. Would you like to follow Jesus? This has has been a powerful tool that's been used in every language probably. It's it's phenomenal how God has used this. I've seen six-year-olds doing this on the street in Australia and people come to faith with it. 
It's, it's, it's a really powerful thing. And, and it's really not that it's a, a, bit, a perfect plan. Some people might say that it's a weak gospel. There's, there's some things that aren't perfect about it. But it's a clear presentation of what, what we're choosing, ourselves or God's plan. If I'm talking to a believer, I find out they're a Christian, they're like, oh yeah, I'm, I'm in good relationship with God. I say, well, you know that God doesn't stop there. He sends his people oops, into the brokenness to share the gospel, to help them come out of brokenness. The gospel doesn't end with a sin of repenting. It ends as more people come to faith. Because whereas the vision of God is for all nations, all peoples, all places. So, what do we share? Why do we do this? Because it's God's plan from the beginning. Who do we share it with? We're asking you to share it with your household relationship, with your, with your oikos, with your, your natural, already friend groups. Who are they? What are you going to share? I've given you three basic tools. The first one is prayer, care, share. Simple, simple, simple. I offer to pray for them. And if they give you a prayer request, then do it on the spot. And then ask them if they have met Jesus before. Share your 15-second testimony and ask them the question, do you know Jesus? Have you met Jesus? And then respond as they give you opportunity. If they're seeking God, then do your best to try to help them meet him. If you're not sure what tool to use, I'm gonna give you some uh, direction here on how to go to and, and watch this and see this and practice this so you can learn it very well. So the last questions that I wanna talk about is when. Four questions, why, who, what do we say, and when do we say it? And I would encourage you to pray every day for the people on your lost and saved list. So the when is when will you pray tomorrow or tonight for those people? For me, I put them on my normal morning devotion prayer. In the morning, I have a prayer list, and on my list are the people that I'm praying for. My mom and my brothers are part of it. That prayer list rarely changes. I wish it would change a lot, but it doesn't change very often, but I pray for them every day. In the evening times when I have an opportunity to pray, I pray for whatever comes to mind. My list is my morning prayer list. <laughs> At night, it's just free willy-nilly. Pray for them I'm every day. Write it down. When will you pray for that list? The next thing is, when will you share with people on your lost list? Pick the one you know the most, the one that you think is the easiest. Invite them to coffee and say, hey, you know I'm a believer and I have a really important question. I just want to ask you if you know Jesus. They're like, oh, I've been dreading this day. Okay, well, the day's here. What do you think? You know, like, write it off as... We just want, I want to have a conversation. I want you to know it's important to me and at least know that it's important. If it's important to you, I want to respond. If they say no, then pray for them some more and try again six months from now. So when will you share? The next thing is this training I've been giving you all night tonight. You can replicate the whole thing. You can share Bible verses with believers and help them to learn that God has a purpose for them. If they're not all here tonight, that's okay because you are. You can tell them all about it. So when will you train somebody that needs to get in the game? When will you train another believer to follow Jesus and partner in the gospel movement that he's given us? So three, three wins. When will you pray? When will you share? When will you share the training? And then the last win, and this one's going to be tough in here, is when will we meet again to see how it's gone? <laughs> When can you and I sit down and say, hey, remember that training we did last week? I asked you those three wins. How's it gone since we met last time? I can't do that with all of you. But it would be amazing if we could. Some of you would be like, oh, no. Listen, this is funny. We, we gave out these boxes on Sunday. And there was multiple people that walked up. And when they saw the box, they're like, oh, what's this? And I tell them about the box. And then they saw the sign up. They're like, oh, you're taking our name. <laughs> What are you going to do with that? I'm like, well, we're not going to share it, but we want to send you an email and encourage you. He's like, oh, this is like accountability, isn't it? You know, <laughs> one person, I kid you not, walked away. They would rather not take a box than put their name down. I was like, interesting. <laughs> what do you do with that? I don't know. So listen, here's, here's the fun things. 
When will you pray for them? Write it down. When will you share? Write something down. Put it down. Share that with your friends so they can ask you next week if you shared with somebody. And when will you train somebody else on how to share their faith? When will you practice? The last thing is, uh, is when can we meet again? And then I want to finish with this. I want to tell you what's in this box. I want to tell you what the purpose is behind it. Um, if every one of you got the box, maybe we don't need to do this. Is there anyone in here that doesn't have the box yet? All right, all right, good. We got hands. That's enough. We're good. As long as there's one, it's worth it. No. Um, so when you open the box, this is, this is the witness campaign box, right? We've, we've been doing the witness campaign for a month. We gave you a prayer guide. We asked you to pray for lost people every day for 30 days, right? And so this is the last phase. We put this box together, and this box represents a really amazing thing. It's something I've never seen done in a church before. And so uh, the executive team came up with this, and somehow it landed on my plate. I don't know, but it, it, anyway, it's not my idea, but it's definitely become my responsibility, and it's been really, really cool. So the first thing when you open it, you're going to see this. It's a little thing that says, thank you for being a witness. And when you open the card, it's got this little thank you note in here. It's a letter from Jason. Jason's a great guy, you know? When you read this, just know he was thinking of you when he wrote it. And uh, so it's a little card that says, thank you so much for even trying out. Thank you for being willing to take a box and being willing to pray for a lost friend. Thank you for being a faithful follower of Jesus. I don't think anything in this box, by the way, is something extraordinary. We're asking you to do normal things that Christians do. Okay, so inside that letter is a $25 gift card to HEB because we're asking you to invite someone into your, into your home and have a meal. And while we think probably most of you don't want or need the $25, we think some of you might need it. And those of you that don't need it, we're going to ask you to give it to someone who does. A lot of people ask me on Sunday, well, can we just give you back the card? And I said, no, I want you to keep the card because we want you to give it to somebody that needs it. And some people are like, well, they don't, I don't really know anybody. I said, you've got to know somebody that can need this card. Now listen, this is my justification. You guys give us your resources all the time. This is something that we as a staff get to do all the time. We get to help ministries and missions. We get to help people that come in here asking for help. We get to do and, and steward the resources that God uses you to provide. And so we can give back $25 for you to steward well. If you need it for a meal, use it. If you don't need it, then give it to someone that does. I think that's amazing. You know, we bought 300 of these things, $325 cards. That's an investment back into our church to see the kingdom of God advance. I've never seen a church do that. That's incredible. The last thing that's inside this, and I'm going to tell you this with a great deal of pride and a little bit of regret. Jason, our pastor, has developed a really amazing evangelism tool. And it helps you understand what happens when we trade our sin for Jesus' perfection. And it's an incredible tool. And he, he, he put together a video for us that shares that gospel presentation in a really powerful, meaningful way. It's incredible. In fact, many people, if you've come to this church in the last couple of years, and if you didn't know Jesus, you probably saw that. There's been a lot of people coming to faith at this church because of that tool and how Jason and Daniel are using it. It's amazing. If you don't have the ability or you feel afraid to share your faith with someone else, there's a QR code on this card, and you can do the evangelism video that Jason has recorded by going to this link. It's on our website, fbcbernie.org slash gospel takes you to that video. And it's there for you as a, I would call it your backup plan. I'm proud of it because it's amazing and I regret it because I don't want to give you a backup plan. Some people might go, whew, thank you. Don't use it unless you really don't think you have a choice. With that said, you should learn the tool because it's really valuable when you're trying to help explain the gospel to people. And Jason has done some trainings on that and we'll have that available again in the future. That's all just in the card. So beyond that, you're going to find a few things. You're going to find a box content so that you can know that everything that we wanted to be in the box is in the box. On the back of that, you're gonna see some really simple conversation starters. These could be anything from like, how long have you lived in Texas, um, to funny things like, what's the craziest thing you've ever done? They're just some questions if you have people and you don't know what to say, which I think all of you probably can do okay. We're Texans, I think we talk just fine. But if we don't, there's some questions, but there's some at the bottom that come spiritual questions. They're questions that are leading. How can we pray for your families at the top of the list? Um, I put at the bottom, please 
at some point in the night when the families are together, make sure you ask that question. This is a, this is a no-brainer. You have to ask this one. There's some other ones. Do you consider your family religious? Have you ever had expectations of God? There's on and on the things here. You can go on. What do you like about Christians? What do you not like about Christians? That's a fun topic. You can get people going that way. And then lastly, have you ever had an interaction with Jesus? Have you ever had prayer or faith? That's in there. So there's these questions. It's just a guide for you. Please don't put this on your table and say, hold on a second. How can we pray for your family? It's not sincere, it's not what we want. Do not use this at the table with your friends. Use it as a reference guide beforehand if you don't know what to say. Take a picture of it, look at your phone if you have to. <laughs> Lastly, we have a couple more resources for you. One is an invitation to Easter. Just, again, this is a, this is a really easy escape plan. I want you to pass this out to your friends, but this does not equate a gospel message sharing. Okay, this is something to give to your neighbors if they're interested in going to church. It does not get you off the hook. (laughs) This is not sharing the gospel. This is just sharing a great invitation with a friend. On the back is our normal service times. On the front is our Easter service times because we have three of them at eight o'clock, 9.30, and 11. We're expecting between two and 3,000 people here on Easter Sunday. It's gonna be a crazy year. We actually are preparing an overflow space and we're gonna ask some of you if you're willing to sign up to go to the overflow so that we can make space for people that don't normally come here. Uh, You're like, that's not me. No, no, please think about it, pray about it. What did Daniel say a few weeks ago? Start working on your attitude now and maybe by Easter we'll be okay. All right, two more things. There's a youth devotional. If the people that you invite have young adults in their group, hand them the youth devotional. It's five days of devotional leading up to Easter. And then there's a kids activity book, coloring sheets and fun little activities. Uh, You'll find a few more fun things. There's a little crayon set, little four thing of crayons. So the colors are there. There's a little ball. Um, We're gonna have you toss the ball around and tell people, it's a fun question. What's your favorite place in the world? And you can ask them about it. If it's a mission thing, you can pray for it. If you don't, you can still ask me, why is it your favorite place? I love Arkansas. That's where the Buffalo River is. I love the Buffalo River. Anybody been there? It's one of my favorite places on the planet. Anyway, just a fun, fun little squeeze ball. And then there's candy. Everyone can enjoy the candy. Okay. So this whole campaign, this whole box, we've designed so that you would have some simple tools that would make it easy for you to have a family in your home sometime between now and Easter. And so we passed out 105 of these boxes on Sunday. We have 195 left. So this Sunday we'll pass them out. They're available after, after the, the time tonight, the training tonight. And ultimately what I want you to know is that we're here to serve you. If you have questions or you're not sure what's next, if you're afraid to share and you want someone to, to help you or practice with you, I'll do my best to go with you whenever you want to go. I don't want to do it for you, but I'll help you if you want to get stronger. So we have one minute left. Does anyone have any questions? Any thoughts? Is this possible? Can you do these things? Do you think you should do these things? Well, I think we're going to be okay then. Can I pray for you? Let's pray. Father God, we thank you so much for the way that you've welcomed us. We thank you for the many links in the chain that make it possible for each one of us to be here today, Father. That in 2,000 years of Christian history, people have shared their faith with someone who shared their faith with someone who shared their faith with someone who shared their faith with us. We pray, God, that we would not be the last link. God, I pray that every single person here would have in their hearts and mind right now people, God, that you put there, people that they need to pray for and and share with and invite. God, we pray that you would help us get a vision that every single person that lives in this city or in this county would hear the gospel in the next year. God, use us to catalyze a movement of the gospel in this place. Lord, we know that you've already been at work at Bernie Maybe as much as half of the city already claims to know you. And we pray, God, that you would strengthen those people. That you would draw them close to your heart. And that, God, they would be your ambassadors everywhere they go. For the people here tonight, God, we pray that you would honor their time. And inspire them with your spirit. 
We love you. Go with us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. If you haven't got a box, they're right outside the doors here. Just sign up with your name, email, and phone number, and take one. We want every family to take one. So have a wonderful night, and uh, we'll be here to answer any questions if you have any. Have a wonderful night. God bless you, and we'll see you next week.